Welcome everyone. The story I'm about to tell is very bizarre. It begins in England and ends in Scotland in 1889. The story is about the life and death of William Henry Barry. I'll leave the rumors of his alias to the end of the story. William Henry Barry's life began sadly. His mother, who was a widow, was admitted to the Wester County and City Lunatic Asylum from Storbridge in 1860. She died there in 1864. Barry was the survivor of a family of three, two boys and a girl. Thrown early on his own resources, he went to work in Wolverhampton and continued in various situations in that town and neighborhood until about 1885. It appears he had taken to a wandering life after that, picking up a living by peddling small wares on the street. About two years later, in 1866, he went to London and began the business of a sawdust and silver sand merchant. It was while working in London that he first met with Ellen Elliot, his unfortunate wife. They met in the house of a man named James Martin, a general dealer with whom Barry had a business connection. Ellen came from a respectable family. She had an illegitimate child who died in the workhouse around the age of two years. Soon after that, she became employed as a servant in the house of James Martin. Martin lent Barry a horse and cart and supplied him with the sawdust and sand at wholesale prices for him to hawk about for sale. Barry was generally described as dissipated and reckless in his habits, spending in drink not only the money he earned, but often what he should have paid to Martin. The unfortunate woman, Elliot, acted in the capacity of a servant in Martin's house, which also included a woman named Spooner, who Martin lived with as his wife. Barry sometimes slept in the house, sometimes in the stable. He had frequent opportunities to meet with Elliot. She was known to possess a considerable amount of money. Barry had set his mind on obtaining the girl's cash by marrying her. The courtship was rocky, but they married. The marriage was also rocky because of Barry's bad habits. He took part of his wife's money and bought a horse and cart and started on his own account, but he continued to drink more heavily than ever. When he was drunk, he gave way to violent fits of passion against his wife. Three weeks after the marriage, he threatened her with a knife and so frightened her that she requested the woman Haynes, in whose house they were lodging, to take away the key of the bedroom at night to prevent him from locking her into the room and murdering her before her cries for help could be heard. He made the money fly recklessly, and before they had been married six months, he had got into his possession the whole sum which accrued from the sale of the six shares of the Union Bank of London. Till they left London in January last, his conduct toward his wife was marked by systematic cruelty and abuse. Cunning and duplicity seemed to be another feature of his character. While treating his wife in the most brutal and cowardly manner, his demeanor toward her relations and others was affable and courteous. In her sister's presence, he was pleasant and agreeable, and when she charged him with abusing his wife, he stoutly denied the accusations. Among his pals, he was a jolly good fellow, even ready to stand a drink, and he always boasted of his money to gratify his vanity. His career in Dundee was brief, but his general conduct was marked with the same love of debauchery and bouncing braggadocia which he had exhibited in London. The first week of his stay in Dundee, he and his wife lodged in the house of Mrs. Robertson in Union Street. In the presence of strangers, he appeared to show affection for his wife. They walked out together and enjoyed themselves after their own fashion. He generally came home the worse of drink, and on one occasion it was said they were both intoxicated. He loved his beer, 
and often brought bottles of beer home with him, a practice he continued after they had removed to the house in Princess Street. What happened next was one of the almost unparalleled atrocities, resembling in its harrowing details the recent Whitechapel tragedies. So intense was the horror and excitement in the community that the perpetrator of the crime in Princess Street was generally supposed to be the infamous Jack the Ripper. A surmise all the more readily to be believed when it became known that the parties had actually come from the east end of London. This part is from the Evening Chronicle of Newcastle upon Tyne, February 11, 1889. The Central News Dundee Correspondent telegraphs that last night William Henry Barry, a sawdust merchant of East London, now residing at Dundee, gave himself up to police, charging himself with the murder of his wife. His own story is that on Monday last he and his wife were drinking heavily and went to bed at night, but he does not know at what hour. He awoke in the morning and found his wife lying on the floor with a rope round her neck. Seized by a mad impulse, he plunged a knife several times into the woman's body and then lifted the corpse into a small case into which he crushed it, packing it with books and papers. He kept it all the week in the room, which he lived in. But on Sunday he got so frightened when alone with the ghastly thing that he confessed what he had done. The police found things as he had stated. The limbs had been twisted, crushed, and broken in revolting manner to enable the corpse to fit in the box. And when removed, the bowels protruded through rents in the abdomen. He and his wife were the only occupants of the house, which consisted of two apartments. In the center of the floor of one of these, the only one they used, he left the box during the whole week while he went in and out. But on Sunday, he was left alone with the box, and became so frightened that he resolved to inform the police. This he did, and the officers immediately visited the house accompanied by doctors. A post-mortem examination was held. Meantime, Barry was in custody. Barry was said to be 29 years old and a respectable looking man. He was rather good looking with a dark complexion, wearing a beard and a mustache, and he had a somewhat timid manner. He was respectably dressed, had on a short black overcoat, and was particularly tidy about the neck, exhibiting a good deal of white linen. He was arrested and led to a cell. The dead woman was tall and good-looking. The dwelling occupied by the pair was a miserable tenement with no furniture in the kitchen, and only a bed and a box in the inner room. The man had been remitted to the sheriff on the charge of murder. This is from the West Lothian Courier, February 16, 1889. In a careful search of the ground, the police had found ample evidence to show that the clothes of the woman had been burned, because they had found a large quantity of buttons and even the remains of a corset. In Barry's endeavor to obliterate all traces of what had taken place, he had forgotten to examine an overcoat which the woman had worn when she was struck down, and this overcoat was smeared with blood, and it was cut in places which corresponded with the parts of the body on which the woman was most severely stabbed. It has come out that the parties did not live very happily since they took up house in Dundee, and on one occasion the deceased complained to a woman that her husband was staying out late at night and drinking heavily. Inspector Aberlein and other detectives who were engaged in the recent Whitechapel murders had instituted inquiries among the relatives of the Berry woman. She had lived very unhappily with her husband since their marriage about 12 months ago. She then had about 240 pounds which is believed to be the reason that Barry married her. The landlady at Union Street was interviewed, and she stated that Barry said he had come through Dundee on business, and that he might get a job there. She asked him what business, and he replied, a carter. 
but she thought from his slim and genteel appearance that he was not in the least fitted for that occupation. She said that when his week was up, he asked for his bill. I gave it to him, and he seemed to think that eight shillings was too much to charge for the room. And as he said, he had seen lodgings advertised in the paper for six shillings, and asked if I would not let my room to him for that sum. I replied that I could not let my room to him for that sum. When he turned his eyes on me, he gave me a look which frightened me. He afterwards said that he would be cheaper to take two empty rooms. On the following day, which was Tuesday the 29th, he went out early in the morning during a very heavy rain, and telling me that he had taken an empty house in Hilltown. About midday he returned and nailed up the box that was usually opened in their room, and readied the other box, which was usually padlocked. Some time after this, two men came to my house and said that they had been instructed to remove two boxes to a house at 113 Prince's Street. As Barry had told me that he was going to reside in Hilltown, I became suspicious and refused to allow the men to take away the boxes. They then told her that the man who instructed them was waiting outside with a barrow. Her daughter looked out and saw Barry, so she allowed them to take the two boxes. She said she could tell one box was very heavy. She commented to the movers that the box looked heavy, and one of them said, It's like as if there was a dead man in it. She said that the remark made her feel uncomfortable at the time. So their belongings were moved to 113 Princess Street. Well, apparently, Barry and his wife were not legal tenants of the Princess Street house. The story runs that Barry procured the key for the purpose of looking at the house, and after he had inspected it, he returned the key. He, however, again requested the use of the key so that his wife might also view the house, the respectable appearance of the man being in his favor. His reasonable request was at once complied with, and the key again was given to him. Since then, Barry and his wife have lived in the house. The door was almost continually locked, and although it had been repeatedly knocked at by representatives of the proprietor, admission could not be obtained. None of the neighbors suspected anything was wrong. During the trial, Barry claimed that his wife, Ellen Barry, hanged herself and that he afterwards mutilated the body. The trial lasted all day, April 24th, 1889. The jury retired at five minutes past ten o'clock and returned exactly at the half hour when the foreman intimated that they unanimously found the prisoner guilty of the charge but strongly recommended him to mercy. The inconsistency of the decision with which a recommendation was an astonishing surprise to those in court. One of the jurymen stated that the recommendation was based partly on the conflicting medical evidence. His lordship asked them to reconsider their verdict. They accordingly left the court, but again returned with a unanimous verdict of guilty. So his lordship pronounced the inevitable sentence appointed by law. Barry was to be hung. The day before his execution, he had left a written confession of his guilt, giving full particulars of his crime. This he handed to the clergyman, who has been attending him since his condemnation, and will be forwarded to the Secretary of Scotland. Satisfaction is expressed that the culprit had admitted his guilt. All formalities were taken care of on the morning of the execution. The Reverend Mr. Goff read the prayers for the dead. Barry uttered the response firmly, frequently clasping his hands and saying, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. The white cap was then put over his face and the lever drawn. Barry's death was instantaneous. The remains of William Henry Barry were interred in the evening, and the service was read by the Reverend Mr. Goff. In accordance with the usual custom, a quantity of quicklime 
was placed in the coffin along with the body and also in the grave. The place of internment was situated in the grounds immediately to the north of the sanitary office, and it was in close proximity to the graves of former murderers. In 1891, it was written that the Dundee authorities were still of the impression that William Henry Berry, who died in Dundee at the hands of the common hangman, was no other than the much spoken of Jack the Ripper. Connected with the suspicion, there are certainly some rather curious facts. Not only did Barry live for years in the locality of the Whitechapel atrocities, but his time had been spent in debauchery, he being often absent from his home at night. His flight to Dundee was never satisfactorily accounted for. Beyond this, however, when he surrendered himself to the police, he stated, and was throughout the coolest of scoundrels, that he was Jack the Ripper, and that he had murdered his wife. It is also a rather notable fact that whereas they were having Jack the Ripper outrages every now and again prior to his leaving London, they ceased concurrently with his arrival in Dundee. Over the years, many, many articles have been written about who could possibly be Jack the Ripper, and many name William Barry. This article, from the People newspaper, May 2, 1993, was entitled, Spot the Ripper. William Henry Barry was one of the many men who was on the list. In July 1999, an article appeared in the Daily Record, talking about a book that claimed that William Henry Barry fit the description of Jack the Ripper and had murdered his wife in the same style as Jack the Ripper. He also had similar handwriting when compared to a note the Ripper had written to the police to taunt them. And he lived in Whitechapel. The name of the book is The Mammoth Book of Jack the Ripper. All the articles are too numerous to show here, but one fact remains. No one will ever be positive that William Henry Barry was Jack the Ripper. Some even say that Jack the Ripper was a woman. All we know for sure is that William Barry was hung for murdering his wife. Subscribe for more stories. See you next time. Bye.